So thank you everyone for being present today. Uh, my talk is a about an exhibition that we organized here at the Dürfner Judaica Museum that's called Impressions of Eastern Europe, Prints from the Permanent Collection. And this is an exhibition that had opened in February um, here in Riverdale and it closed just a few short weeks later due to our uh, need with the rest of the city, the rest of the museums and so many institutions to prevent the spread of COVID-19. The exhibition includes lithographs, etchings, engravings, and woodcuts by 16 artists who were born between 1853 and 1912. But I will just uh, add that most of them were born, say, from the 1880s to the early 20th century. And these are artists who participate in, participated in some of the most significant art movements of the 20th century. And they were working at a time of rapid changes in society, including urbanization, secularization, industrialization, technological innovation, and seismic political and cultural shifts. Their genre scenes, folktale illustrations, portraits, and character studies evoke nostalgia for a communal past, solemn awareness of the fragility of life and deep reverence for tradition. In order to provide some context for you about um, our museum, assuming many of you are unfamiliar with it, it's open to the public and it's located on the campus of the Hebrew Home at Riverdale, which is a nonprofit long-term care facility here in the Bronx. And we're located right on 32 acres right along the Hudson River. So it's really, it's a beautiful um, place to visit when you're able to visit right now. The campus is entirely um, closed. And the museum is located, I want to show you if I can use this laser pointer. It's located right in this uh, building here. Um, and I just have a couple of, uh, additional images. This is the exterior pavilion that the museum is located in. And this is one of our sculptures. We have more than three dozen sculptures on the campus. This is River Spirit by Joel Perlman, um, right side, outside the uh, entrance to the pavilion that the museum is in. And when you would walk into that pavilion on the right-hand side is actually the entrance to the museum. And here's the interior space where we have an ongoing exhibition called Tradition and Remembrance Treasures of the Durfner Judaica Museum. And within this space, we do changing exhibitions, which is where the current exhibition that I'm talking about is now located. It actually takes up this changing exhibition space right there. Um, and the museum was founded in, in 1982, although on a, in a different building on the campus, it's now located in this newer building. So I want to begin and end my talk um, with this work, which is by Ilya Shor. It's called Jewish Wedding. It was done in the 1950s. It's a wood engraving of a Hasidic uh, wedding. You see it here. It's kind of become the iconic and emblematic image for this exhibition and also for the, the themes that I'm going to talk about uh, today. Uh, in this talk. So um, uh, Ilya Shore was born in, in Galicia or Galicia and he moved from Warsaw to Paris as an art student in 1937 and then fled Nazi occupied France arriving in New York on December 1st 1941 and as I said very emblematic the signature image of our exhibition and the question of how art from the past speaks to us today is one that should inform just about any museum exhibition. And this image in particular illustrates, I think, how um, at our current moment, the works in this exhibition are particularly resonant and meaningful. So I'm going to start off briefly with it and then come back to it in, in my conclusion. An article by uh, Danielle Campo Amor from the July 28th New York Times helps provide some further context for looking at the works in this exhibition in our moment. The headline in the New York Times, Why We Reach for Nostalgia in Times of Crisis, immediately caught my attention and I thought of the artists 
in our show and their experiences. In the Campo Amor um, article, the author, paraphrasing a clinical psychologist specializing in traumatic stress, writes that, quote, in times of trauma and overwhelming stress, it's a natural instinct to feel nostalgic and rely on those feelings for comfort and a sense of normalcy. To quote the psychologist that Campo Amor cited, whose name is Valentina Stoicheva, quote, trauma takes away our gray areas. It divides our timeline into a before and an after. Nostalgia may create a longing for another safer time in the past, but it also helps people transitioning from one stage of life to the next or helps them navigate specific stressors. I think this understanding of the function of nostalgia both illuminates for us its role in the work of 19th and early 20th century Jewish artists who were subjected to trauma in their own lives and the appeal of their works to audiences and collectors who could empathize with their experiences. The question now is, can we still empathize with those experiences, relate them to our own lives? Can they help us navigate our own traumas as individuals and collectively? As we go on to look at some examples of particular works from the exhibition, I want to share with you the questions that have informed my thinking about this. What were the traumas faced by the artists in this exhibition and how were these reflected in their art? How did artists of the last century respond to displacement, genocide, and massive social and political upheaval? What were their experiences? What can an understanding of their sources of inspiration and choice of style teach us today? How did art help them to maintain hope and belief in the future during periods of strife and desperation? So to look at the next artist, Depictions such as Shore, the previous artist we just saw, depictions such as his evolved and were influenced by the work of an artist a generation or two older than most of the other artists in the exhibition, Isidore Kaufman, whose Jewish bride you see here is included in the show. Kaufman studied drawing in Budapest in 1875 and the following year moved to Vienna to continue his art studies. He began his career as a portrait painter in the 1880s, he was creating genre scenes or pictures of everyday life and began to include Jewish characters that likely appealed to a growing bourgeois Jewish clientele who desired a connection to what appeared to be a vanishing Jewish past. Kaufman's portraits and scenes of Jewish life were created in the studio, yet rooted in direct observation and a keen interest in accurately rendering details of costume and props. They evoke a, deep, evoke a deeply spiritual people in a way that was also striking, strikingly modern. Now, beginning in the 1890s, as a result of extensive travels in the shtetls of Moravia, Slovakia, Galicia, Ukraine, and Russian Poland, where he met deeply observant Jews at a moment when Jews in the cities were becoming increasingly modern and secular, his work underwent a transformation. His portrayals became like this work very iconic, refined, very reverential, as you see in this example. And so this was a print after one of his paintings, and this was distributed widely in the 1920s. This is another one of his prints in the exhibition, Friday Evening Brody, also from circa the 1920s, and it was a lithograph done after a painting of circa 1904. And here, here you see the painting on the left, again, not in our exhibition, which is all um, prints, and a postcard of Brody on the right. And I think you can see immediately the kind of transformation or poetic leaps that he takes in the painting, which really elevates and, and makes the scene much more spiritual, otherworldly, and mystical than, say, in every an ordinary uh, postcard. One of the things that uh, is often pointed out is this very dramatic light in the windows and also in the back in the synagogue. And if you take a good look at the synagogue in the background and the postcard on the right, you notice that in the left it has a dome 
and he added that that's a complete invention. So it's really all about creating a composition that um, becomes very symbolic, very moving. And um, Brody was at the time, uh, by then, uh, many of the Jews in the Hasidic community were actually very poor. And so those are the people that he's elevating. He's, he's really um, enamored and just taken with their spirituality, with their true awesomeness. Uh, and that's what he depicts here. And I think in a way he becomes a model uh, for later artists. So we begin with him. Um, this is work by another artist in our exhibition, Hermann Struck, two examples of several of his works uh, that are in the show. And Struck was born into an Orthodox Jewish family in Berlin and studied at the Academy of Fine Arts in that city from 1895 to 1900. He joined what was known as the Berlin Secession in 1904. And this was a group that separated from the more mainstream art academy to pursue more modern kinds of art, impressionism or working in a post-impressionist style at the time. And he was also very much um, uh, a cultural Zionist. He joined the Zionist movement, which strongly supported Jewish cultural expression. And he actually went and visited the Holy Land Palestine in 1903 first creating etches, etchings of Jewish life and the landscapes he saw there. But he also becomes enamored of Eastern European Jewish life um, after serving in World War I, where he had his first personal encounters with the, with the Jews of Eastern Europe, uh, particularly the traditions and practices among the Hasidic community uh, that he that he really becomes immersed in for the first time. And the images that he creates are both um, nostalgic and they emerge from this trauma of his experience of the community during World War I, of really seeing the hardships and poverty at the same time he's undergoing this whole traumatic experience of being a soldier. Um, so he had a great interest of uh, portraying Eastern European Jews uh, in his art, and just a few years after these works were created, um, the work on the right is from we know from around 1919. We don't have an exact date for the for the work for the work on the left, but also probably an early work from this period. Just a few years later, he emigrated to Israel and created a hub of Jewish cultural life in his own home there in Haifa, and continued to reflect back on that that European Jewish life that had been. Uh, left behind. Um, and he remained active in the Orthodox Jewish community there in Eretz Israel. And his depictions are integrally related to the changes that were occurring in his own life. And so if we take this idea of the function of nostalgia, it may have been uh, for him a whole process that helped to relieve the stress of navigating both personal and community upheavals in his, in his looking back, in, his, in the sense of nostalgia that we see exhibited uh, in his work. The next artist was actually, um, was a student for a while of Hermann Strokes, and his name is Jacob Steinhardt. And Steinhardt grew up in a rural Polish village that included Jews and Poles, but was under German rule until after World War I. And his family was traditional, though over time they became less religiously um, observant. And his later work, uh, he goes through this uh, period of being very much uh, enmeshed in the avant-garde of the period, but his later work would evoke the memories of his childhood and his feelings of nostalgia for the small town where he, where he grew up. Uh, at a young age, he was also sent away from his hometown to boarding school in Berlin. His father died. His mother uh, encouraged his interest in art, and he was able to get patrons to, to help him pursue his schooling. Um, he studied with the painter Lovis Corbin in Berlin, and he learned etching, in particular from Struck, the artist we just saw. He also went to Paris in 1909. He studied very briefly with Matisse, among other artists. Uh, there, he returned to Berlin and 
uh, sometime before 1912, he, might, he met another Jewish artist named Ludwig Meidner, with whom he felt a kinship. And they were both very interested in creating an art with dramatic content, an art that was both about expressing emotion and, and inspiring a, intense emotional responses in um, their viewers. And so the name of this group was actually, it was an expressionist group and it was called Die Patheticer, meaning the pathetic ones. And not that they were pathetic or to be pitied, but they were interested in feeling, in emotions and in conveying that in their work. So that was founded in 1912 and Steinhardt was around this time devoting himself to biblical subjects uh, such as Job, the subject here of this work from 1914, uh, which he also painted in oil. And the, you see, I mean, there's also cubist elements in this work. There's a lot of jagged, it's almost like, it's almost like a picture composed of broken glass in a way, very fractured, very, um, very um, dangerous in a way, you know, almost physically dangerous in the way that it's portrayed. And then that, that was meant to suggest this instability in society, um, especially around the time of the coming of World War I. And he had a lot of success in the avant-garde art world at the time. His work was uh, shown in the gallery of the avant-garde monthly Der Sturm, and he became one of the most progressive artists in Berlin at the time. And, and you'll see in this later work, uh, quite a change in style. So if you picture this, now we're going to look at this work. Um, it's a later work. It's from 1933 and very much reflects the mood of the time. Um, the activities of the avant-garde group that he was associated were already had been cut short by World War I. Uh, when uh, Steinhardt was drafted, he served in Lithuania, again, where he finds himself drawn to the deep religious faith of the Hasidic community. And he was in awe again of the intense spiritual atmosphere in the midst of poverty, suffering, hardship. And he, you know, he watched in, in with this, you know, feelings of awe at the customs and the fervent dedication to prayer and study that he found among, among these devout Jews. And again, this gets wrapped up with his own experience of trauma, the hardships, uh, the starvation, the illness, what he suffered um, as a soldier. He actually had, he, he ends up coming home from the war in, in, in a complete state of collapse. And so then, you know, for himself, it's a period that he looks back to uh, throughout his career. So after the Nazis came to power in 1933, again, the same work, the same year this work was created, he also fled the country and he settled in Jerusalem, which he had also previously visited in 1925. And steeped in that nostalgia, uh, he continued to represent biblical and other Jewish subjects, as well as the landscape of his new homeland for the rest of his life. The next artist in the exhibition um, that we're gonna look at is um, Friedrich Feigl. Um, in 1907, Feigl, who was born in Prague, um, was a founder of an avant-garde Czech artist group that is known as Ozma, the Eight. And um, the members of that group had also left their academic training behind. They had been students at the Prague Academy of Fine Arts, but they were looking for um, a better way a more authentic way to represent their times, their moment, the emotion of this first decade of the 20th century. So early in his career, Feigl worked in, ex in an expressionist style. And in 1911, he also moved to Berlin, which was a real center for the avant-garde. And he exhibited with the Berlin Secession. His graphic art, book illustrations, and portlet portraits were widely published in German. Um, in the wake of World War I, in which he also served, um, in 1921, Feigl published a print portfolio of the streetscapes and people of the Jewish ghetto of Prague, where his mother's family had lived for generations and where he had spent his childhood. So again, this nostalgia, this 
hooking on to the past at a moment of making uh, transitions, of navigating through trauma in life in the early post-World War I period. And that same year, um, an album published for the 12th World Zionist Congress held in Carlsbad featured this woodcut, um, here, Israel evoking the Shema, the daily prayer recited by observant Jews, along with etchings by Hermann Struck and Jacob Steinhardt, the two artists we've also looked at, and another um, eight, another eight other artists. Um, our exhibition in also includes um, artists who were born in Europe and who emigrated as children to the U.S. Um, such as Max Weber, whose work you see here. He arrived with his family from the Russian Empire at the age of 10 and settled in Brooklyn. And the past may also have provided solace for Weber at difficult moments in his life. He attended the Pratt Institute where his teacher and earliest influence, Arthur Wesley Dow, who studied Japanese art, contributed to Weber's modernist figural style and simplified compositions. Traveling to Paris to study at the Academy Julienne in 1905, Weber was also influenced by Picasso and Matisse, uh, with whom he also briefly studied. He returned to New York in 1909 and has been credited with helping to introduce Cubism to America. So he worked in a style influenced by Cubism and Futurism, but around 1918 began to use these techniques while incorporating religious themes related to his Orthodox Eastern European Jewish heritage into his work. Um, by the 1920s, he returned to a more representational style while continuing to explore Jewish themes, an interest that art historians have linked directly to the death of his parents. So again, that trauma, you know, if you're a, if you come to the U.S. as a as a young child, your parents really represent completely that past, that European world, and when they die, then again, that's that trauma, that's that moment of that timeline being cut off, the before and the after, and so uh, turning to Jewish themes perhaps is a way to navigate that own trauma in, in, one, in one's life. So this particular um, work, it's a lithograph called Draped Head, um, is related to um, another work, another draped head that he did before 1923, this canvas. And, you know, so for, for myself, when I saw that, when I had seen this work in the Phillips collection, it, it told me conclusively that the other draped head in our collection was actually a Jewish work because it's known and there's documentation around the work on the left that this is a Jewish woman with head covering. And so this is a theme that he did in his work, even though it's maybe more nuanced in the, in the lithograph to completely identify her as a Jewish woman. Um, and like that work, this figure here with downcast eyes is pictured She's very much in contemplation. There's a sense of otherworldliness or mysticism in both works. They also evince a solidity and sculptural monumentality that can be found in Picasso's work of the same period in the 20s. And the qualities of otherworldliness reflect this solemn spirituality that Weber absorbed not just from Jewish influences, but he was using um, stylistically the influence of Byzantine art and the 16th century Spanish artist El Greco to convey, I think, a sense of Jewish spirituality. Look, you know, he's searching for that language. How do I convey this? Um, and the exhibition also includes uh, works by artists who explored the Holocaust in their work, and sometimes over a period of decades, um, confronting the trauma of the past, not through nostalgia, but in an attempt to represent it directly when the Holocaust had had a major impact on, on their own lives. This is um, Arvid Blatis. Um, when he was a young child living in Kovno, um, in the Russian Empire. Blatis and his family were deported to Ukraine, but allowed to return in 1921. And for me, I, I thought of, you know, it's an example of what happened with many of these artists. They never were, never remained, for the most part, did not remain in one place. They were constantly um, 
on the move, you know, immigrants, migrants, um, remaking themselves, remaking their lives. From 1924 to 1926, he studied at the Academy of Arts in Berlin, then led by the German Jewish Impressionist Max Lieberman. Um, in 1926, Blattis arrived in Montparnasse, in Paris as an art student, and he was the, known as the youngest member of the School of Paris. He continue, continued to exhibit his work in both uh, Kaunas or Kavno and Paris before World War II, maintaining the connections to, to the old world. Um, he fled Nazi-occupied France in, 1940, in 1941 and survived the war, though his mother perished in a concentration camp. Later, he lived in New York and Venice, creating works that incorporated Jewish themes and recalled incidents of the terrible violence and horrific slaughter of Jews during the Holocaust, including a memorial in the Venice ghetto that if you've been there, you may have, have seen. Uh, and this uh, print depicts the Babi Yar massacre, one of the largest and most brutal mass killings um, carried out during the Holocaust in, um, in Kiev, which was then the capital of the Soviet Ukraine at the time. Um, it, it occurred, it was murder carried out in the Babi Yar Ravine over two days in September of 1941. And it was, um, you know, it's interesting that the lithograph was created in 1969, but it was based on paintings on the subject that Blatis had done in 1944 that are actually in the Lithuanian National Museum of Art in Vilnius. Uh, today, and there are two of them. This is one, and this is another version. Uh, another, another artist who created work about his um, ex experience, um, this is actually right after the war, is Albert Dove Siegel. And Siegel lost his father at a young age and grew up poor. Um, he joined the Zionist, Zionist youth movement uh, Maccabi Hatzair and studied enameling, engraving, and painting at the Ca Academy of Fine Arts um, in Kolesvar. In 1933, he moved to Bucharest. Um, by 1939, it was difficult to find work, and he was arrested and made part of a forced labor battalion, um, but nevertheless began an underground art school because art could sustain him. Uh, when a fascist military government seized power in late 1940, attacks on Jews increased, um, and it became in increasingly difficult for he and, for, and his wife to live under these deteriorating conditions. Um, they did escape deportation, though most of their uh, family were murdered in the Holocaust. And Siegel, um, reestablished his career in Bucharest after the war, and in 1946 he was even given an exhibition at the National Museum. However, because of the communist regime, life was very difficult, especially for Jews, um, and they tried to leave. They were going to come to the, to, um, they were going to um, come to actually come to the United States, but they were afraid even to have those visas, that there would be retribution against them by the government, and, and they tore them up. And then they went on an illegal ship to um, Eretz Israel um, in December of 1947 and were intercepted by the British and were taken to a, um, uh, were detained at a camp in Cyprus um, where he made original drawings, which he later um, did as etchings. And so we have a group of them in our collection and we showed several of them in the exhibition. These are just um, two examples. So this is just called Detainees in Cyprus from Cyprus Camp, which is the series. And this is Cyprus Camp from Cyprus Camp. Um, this is a particularly avant-garde one. And the family were eventually, they were released by the British, but they had their young son with them and they were allowed to go on to Palestine. Uh, but they eventually resettled in New York in 1959. Um, and so coming back really to this theme of nostalgia, this longing for the past, it comes very much to the foreground in the 1950s and 1960s in works by other immigrant modernist artists who arrived in North America during and after the Holocaust, such as Simon Karshmar and Illy Shore, who embraced folk traditions as authentic Jewish expression. And in the celebratory post-war images of Hasidic life in the US by another artist named Tully Filmus, an earlier emigre, which we'll also see in the next 
um, few slides as we come to the end in the next few minutes. Um, so this is Simon Karshmar, and Karshmar attended the Warsaw School of Fine Art and then went to Paris in 1929 to continue his art studies. He made a living buying and sorting furs. In 1941, um, during the German occupation, he and his family fled to Nice in the south of France. And as family members went into hiding and others were deported to concentration camps, Car um, including his own wife, who had, was deported, Karshmar joined the resistance. After the war, he was reunited with his wife and son, and the family emigrated first to Israel in 1951, and after a few years to Canada in 1955. And there in Canada, Karshmar rediscovers or discovers the work of Sholem Alechem. And that is what became the inspiration for him to then look at his own childhood and to kind of uh, find the memories in his own childhood, um, recalling the summers that he visited his grandfather in a small Lithuanian village and creates, at this point, these very nostalgic uh, works inspired by those memories. So the, this is from a portfolio um, that's actually called Shtetl, and it's a collection of images depicting the scenes of life in his grandfather's village. So we have here the Simcha Torah, Dance of the Torah, and we have this market scene. And they're all drawn in a naive manner that evokes that innocence of childhood, literally like a child's drawing, uh, you know, he, we don't have conventional or traditional, you know, Renaissance perspective. Um, the figures may not be in scale. And it's done with this childlike naivete related to the subject matter itself, appropriate to the subject matter it's, itself. Another work on the left of Shabbat coming out of synagogue. And on the right, it's a chuppah marriage scene. And then this is... Um, the prayer to the moon or blessing of the new moon. And we have maybe a milkman in the cart, the dairyman, and some klezmer musicians and the young boys studying. Tully Filmis is the other artist I, I mentioned who um, was in, who, whose nostalgia plays an important role. Um, in his work, he came to the United States with his family at the age of 10, and they settled in Philadelphia. He studied at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts and attended seminars at the Barnes Foundation, which exposed him to the work of the French Impressionists and to Mac Matisse and Picasso by, through that very famous private collection and private museum. In 1927, he was awarded a fellowship to study in Paris with André Lotte. He also traveled to Florence, Rome, and Munich. And he returned to the U.S. during the Depression and settled in New York, where he shared a studio with Willem de Kooning. So you see, he had a lot of exposure to all kinds of art, but what we, he was very much drawn to were these kinds of Jewish subjects. Um, and he also studied um, at NYU in the Arts Students League. And he actually said about his work that his interest in Jewish subjects emerged from his desire to preserve the memory of traditional Eastern European Jewish life and to document contemporary Jews in the wake of the Holocaust. And the, the, Has, the Hasidic community were a community perceived as if risen from the ashes. So again, this is a work that he created in the early 1960s. And I think, you know, there's this kind of meshing of this idea of the contemporary Hasidim that he may have seen in the US, this group that really embodied survival, the past, you know, the phoenix rising from the ashes, and that's meshed together with this nostalgia uh, or childhood memories, the recollections or, or longing for the place that his family had come from. Um, and I said that I would come back at the very end, and this is where we're coming now, to The Jewish Wedding by Ilya Shore. And in the beginning, I didn't tell you much, I didn't tell you a lot about him, so let me just say in the next couple of minutes. Um, 
1920, at the age of 16, Shore was apprent apprenticed to an engraver and he learned metalwork and engraving, which he utilized in his sculpture prints, jewelry, and Jewish ritual objects. In 1928, he began his studies in painting at the Academy of Fine Arts in Warsaw. And that's where he met his future wife, Raja, two years later. In 1937, Shore was awarded a grant to study in Paris and he worked on a mural for the Polish Pavilion at the Paris World's Fair that year. And he exhibited at the Salon d'Automne in 1938. As German troops advanced on the city in 1940, he and his wife fled. They stayed in Marseille, where Shore was twice um, uh, interned or detained by the Vichy government authorities while they were waiting for visas to emigrate. And they left for the United States from Lisbon, Portugal in December 1941, just days before Pearl Harbor, and settled on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. They lost most of their family and friends who remained trapped in Europe. Um, as he reinvented his life in New York, Shore's work evokes the steadily the shtetl culture that was lost during the Holocaust in a style that is at once modern and naive. And these are some examples of his other work. It represents with authenticity the world from which he came and acknowledges his artistic heritage. His father, who's pictured here, was a Hasidic folk artist and sign painter. And Shore paid homage to him in his art. Um, he's always identifiable by this beard and hat. And coming back to this work, um, and here you see some, maybe some figures, you know, with the hat or here, the hat and the pais and the beard. And so they're always, it's always an homage to his father. It's always that, that memory. So just in, in conclusion, when I wonder what attracts me to this particular work, I return to Campo Amor's observation in the Times, quote, nostalgia serves as a kind of emotional pacifier, helping us to become accustomed to a new reality that is jarring, stressful, and traumatic. Is that why Shore returned again and again to his shtetl themes? I think so. And as a viewer today, I think his work might do, might do the same for me. So, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, S uh, Susan. So uh, while you are gathering your thoughts for questions, which I encourage you to place in the Q and A section of the of the screen at the bottom, I have a couple of questions from myself uh, to start the conversation. Um, it, it was really fascinating to see the question that you raised and, uh, and the reflection of nostalgia in, in, this, uh, in this art and over such a long period of time, o over different traumas, uh, right? The, some of the art comes from early 20th century, clearly uh, referring to some of the early 20th century um, pogroms or migration only. Um, and some of that was the later, later art. But one thing that struck me about the, uh, the images first you when you were talking about Brody uh, early in your in your presentation uh, you juxtaposed the the art and the postcard and what was fascinating uh, was that in the postcard you saw a uh, a diverse group of Jews or, Jew or people on uh, in front of the synagogue, whereas in the art, predominantly in this on Brody and in subsequent, it's the repetition of the male Hasidic imagery. So I wonder whether you could comment on these artists who are modern men who mm -hmm. go to modern uh, art schools, who uh, live in big cities, uh, who are m sort of manufacturing nostalgia and manufacturing that image that is not really truthful historically, and they know it. And, they, and it's also a very gendered past that they are projecting. Um, of the, of the, and we've seen it also in um, the photography of Roman Vishniak, for instance. He photographed all kinds of people, but what is published is that certain uh, it's the it's predominantly male, uh, poor, and Hasidic in in that uh, in that imagery. So I wonder whether you could comment on on that. 
Yes, I, it's very true, and it's true in the other, you know, works of other many other Jewish male artists who even even are not in the show, like um, Sigmund Menkes is an example. We have a beautiful painting of his in our collection. And it's always the tradition is passed from generation to generation by men, you know, by the male, the, the father to the son, or the older man with the beard to the young boy, that share a talit, like in a Menkes picture. Yeah, it's, it's structured, it, it is structured, and I think it evolves. It'd be interesting really to, to look at it. So, it becomes reified or, or strengthened into the, in the early 20th century versus what's happening in the 19th century because Kaufman actually represents many, many women. You know, they're like enthroned like that in those symbolist portraits, um, Kaufman. Or Kaufman has Friday evening, a painting in the collection of the Jewish Museum. Um, he painted into 1920, but remember he's born in 1853. He was representing a much earlier generation. So he has the woman doing the lighting the Shabbat candles actually alone in a room. She doesn't even need the men and the rest of the rest of the family. Um, um, uh, Moritz Oppenheim is a much earlier 19th century artist who, who um, did a suite of, of Jewish customs, um, rituals, Women are always there, families and women are always there. And I think it's such a great observation because it just, it, it, it becomes more um, ex exclusive and women being excluded uh, by the 20th century. Yeah, and what about the women artists? I mean, you mentioned mm -hmm. Shor's wife was an artist. So uh, where, yeah, yeah. what, mm -hmm. what I, I, I know it was not part of the exhibition, but your, uh, knowledge of, of Jewish art, what, are, what is the iconography that comes through in women's work? So Reja did, I don't know her, um, well actually that's not just, that's not exactly, she, so she didn't do Jewish themes in fine art the way he did. She also made jewelry, he died in 1960, she made jewelry, she did make some like mezuzahs and objects, but she didn't do the genre scenes the way he did. Um, I, someone had asked me um, about this one, I've, I've talked about the show before, and it also gets pointed out, well, where are the women artists? And so, for example, there's another um, woman in the show, but I should have included her today, but I I didn't. Rahel Salit Marcus, and she died in, in Auschwitz, I, I believe in 1943. She was also, she was born in Woj. She came to Paris and was deported from Paris, and most of her work was destroyed. But she also, she did il illustrations to show on the Lachem. Um, and that was within the context of this burgeoning uh, publishing world of, you know, of Yiddish and Hebrew publishing in Berlin in the 20s. Um, and so in illustrating those stories, it's the full, you know, uh, gamut of, of the characters that inhabit Sholem Aleichem. Mm -hmm. So it is, it's very true that this masculine um, kind of macho modernist, right. modernist artist, right. and even, women. even the literature, right? Abramovich as Sholem Aleichem, that in, invented persona, uh, or, or, or rather, as his under his pen, penman, he also creates this certain imagery. Even though he is a very, uh, very modern man himself, but he does it in order to critique it at some level, the more traditional society, right? So it's it's interesting here. That's not what's going on, right? The the imagery is more. It's not about the critique of that society. It's yeah. more about that preserving a certain image of the past that is distorted by gender and by by. I think I think it's like a very very parallel to to today. I mean people who may themselves be very assimilated, but want to support Jewish continuity will uphold the most traditional and it ends up most patriarchal, you know, version of, of the religion. Mm -hmm. And, and I think, I think, yeah, I think they didn't have other ways to, for themselves, they didn't have other ways. I mean, uh, 
you know, I know other, other, you know, Jews today who very much say like, it's the women who, who, you know, not, not just the, the, in, in the match, match, you know, the matrilineal descent, but, you know, it's the women, it's the women who preserve, preserve the heritage. And there are some people who, who think like that, um, you know, and all the things that women do for the religion, but you don't, you know, you don't see it. And, you know, they're all, they're very much in a system and ma the system, it's in the academies too, you know, there are people who studied with, you know, Lieberman and the academy and, and everything is designed and structured around. And you can that. see once the language is developed, it sort of follows through. So mm -hmm. there is a question about, uh, in reference to Chagall, how can, whether you can compare the images of the villages with that, those uh, those uh, of Chagall, the you know the image of the villages with tilted roofs that you've shown, and some of the and the and those that are so iconic that are known from Chagall. Yeah, you see that um, in the Karshmar mm -hmm. um, work. Absolutely, I think you know. Obviously, he's the iconic figure. Um, the, the prints in our collection are just his, like, we have biblical work and, and so he didn't have that shtetl culture and that's actually why I didn't include him because unfortunately we don't have those prints in our, in our collection. But yeah, yeah, there's a, an iconography, like, I've also been very interested in, in being able to trace, you know, this fascination with things like the Hasidic dance or, or specific representations um, that originate in, in European artists and how they, how they are transformed and used yeah. over and over and over again um, by the um, artists working, like, especially in, in North America. Um, and how they become diluted. You know, that's why for me working in this material, like in a way, these are these are very important artists. They're they're very well trained, they're modernist artists and they're taking up this subject. So I wouldn't say they're kitsch, you know, but they're you know, I I think there's a lot of Jewish homes of maybe you know, people of like my grandparents' generation who are now all deceased, but where you would go into their homes and you see those those fiddlers and those you know different prints and you don't quite know what to make of them you know and and um that's why for me bringing this work together which is all from our collection at this time like how is this relevant why does this move me now what can i see in it um so that actually leads uh, nicely to a question about your collection and how did these works come into uh your collection so yeah, so you know, our you know a lot a lot of our collection is just who who were the donors, who were the collection collectors, why were they interested in us, were were they looking to donate things that maybe another a larger institution already had many of or didn't want to take? Is there something less like Karshmar? He's so unknown. I didn't know his work until until I saw it here, or Albert Dove Siegel, whose work is also in the Holocaust Museum in, in Washington. Um, you know, it was, all of these things, or mo almost all of these things were acquired before I came here, and I came here in 2008. Um, so just, you know, Jewish collectors who who maybe collected those things for the same reason, out of their own nostalgia, or they were the people who had the dancing Hasid, you know, on the wall in their living room. And then at some point their children didn't want it uh -huh. <laughs> after uh -huh. they died and it okay. ended up here or something like that. And, and so it's really, it's wonderful to bring it all together and to create a context for it. So another question is about uh, change in Jewish art from World War II uh, to World War III to the foundation and, and flourishing of Israel uh, and about hope and resilience and in, I mean, in art, whether you could comment. That's a bit, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big, big question, but I, you know, I was just thinking about some artists whose work related to the foundation and flourishing of Israel. So like the sculptor Jacques Lipschitz, who worked in Paris, he worked through Cubist phase. He did many works that were um, literally about the, uh, you know, triumphs of, of, you know, David over Goliath kind of thing. And also, um, using um, myth or biblical stories to create works that were about the defeat of Hitler and the establishment of the state of Israel. So that is, 
you know, one, one way to see it, uh, artists who live at different times. And even Ben Sean, who was an, an artist who in the 1930s, his work was very universal, all about, um, um, you know, social justice, helping the underdog, the worker. Um, in the 40s, his work became very Jewish. Yes, some of it related to the same nostalgia, but also connected to Israel specifically. Um, he did lots of work that, that recognized um, the state of Israel. I mean, he even did like commercial work for, for El Al at, at some point. Um, you know, the, the Jewish people, you know, coming out of the ashes. Um, for him, his work was very layered. He did work that responded both to the period of the Holocaust, but also to those pogroms because he had been in touch um, or lost touch during going back to World War One. lost touch with his grandfather and his family in Europe. So, so very layered. Mm -hmm. And there is a question about Itzhak Holtz, whether you know of, yes. Uh... I haven't, I will, I'll look that up. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that solves that. And um, any anything else? I, I think one of the uh, a couple of people asked about whether they could return to these images somewhere. I I, yeah, I so said that, I... yes. The, the 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 talk will be online, but I think people would like to see and and maybe reflect more closely about uh, of the images. So if you go to, I, can I share my screen just one second? Because I had a slide at the end. If, I'm, if I put this back on for a second. And, and I what, certainly can share the link later on with. Uh, with oh. oh, why can I get, there's all my contact yeah, information. Yeah. Yes, all my contact information, Facebook. Uh, our website, there was a little brochure we did. There's a little like slideshow of the exhibition on the website. So, so this is all on this slide. Okay. I think that uh, that certainly covers the, some of the questions from the audience. I wonder whether you have any, any other parting words and parting um, thoughts. Uh, my, my uh, certainly, uh, and we talked about it briefly, my, my impression was that, as you said, that there is depth to something that looks like kitsch, right? That looks mm -hmm. like the, the, that, that are in the meaning once you learn about the artist's experience. And uh, I don't know whether you want to comment a little bit about the, the, the process of discovery uh, about, of their lives and then how their lives spoke to that art that you saw in your collection. You know, I, I, I started to see the prints in the collection and I started to learn more about the artists and to see, you know, that, and we have, you know, this is an, I, this is today too, um, that we see that never, no one is, ends up in the place that they started. They are in constant movement, you know, migration and movement and change and those borders. And that's um, part of, our lives always. I mean, I think even historically within Judaism, that Judaism was uh, porous in, in quite a long time ago, um, you know, and always had room. But anyway, that's a slightly different subject. But for me, why this is important is because I'm actually this Jew who has almost always been where she started out. So my parents were born in the Bronx. I live in the Bronx. <laughs> I, I've lived in a, places in between. Their parents and uh, my grandparents either were born here or immigrated around, you know, 1900 mm -hmm. in the first decade. Mm -hmm. And I think I thought growing up, oh, this is the way it always is, isn't it? Like this for everyone. And, you know, I worked at the Jewish Museum and I worked on a lot of exhibitions about Jewish identity and it kind of, you know, took me a long time to really say, well, like, no, it's not, it's not like that. I'm kind of this exception. And so maybe that's another part of my interest in this, mm -hmm. in this group. Um, and that notion, and, and again, like what I, what I said about that, that notion um, that, you know, these are highly trained modernist artists and they choose this subject matter. I mean, I think we had kind of, you know, there's like, oh, where did the artists go wrong? They went wrong when they started to do 
the Jewish subject matter. You know, I mean, it's not true today. And that, again, is a whole other discussion, as I know, you know, you know, bringing, you know, people like Siona Benjamin and other contemporary Jewish artists, it's, it's different. But, you know, historically, it was like that, because there was no, there was no mainstream audience there. There was, you know, but there were collectors very much interested in the work, you know, so that's why they're making the work in 62 and 64 and 59 and even in the 20s. There are these different periods where there is a strong market for it. And is there, are there any books with these artists and their work that have been published? Um... So a lot of them illustrated books and um, yeah, yeah, there's, there's so many, you know, like Steinhardt who emigrated to Israel. Well, he had patrons in the United States who went to great efforts to, there's a whole book on his woodcuts, which you can just, you know, you can still buy for $10, you know, or use, use books, um, that illustrates all his woodcuts, for example. So yes. And, and then for other artists are being rediscovered like Friedrich Feigl, um, the Czech artist actually in the last few years sort of went from obscurity to people finding out more about his work and there's a huge monograph on him not in English though in that case and so some of these artists have now had exhibitions in in Europe so um, it's interesting to see the the fluctuations in their in their reputation you know somebody like Tully Filmus who did that Hasidic dance he has beautiful beautiful um, paintings and I think he lived right here maybe in Great Neck or something, or Max Weber definitely lived in Great Neck. And, you know, so the, these, the, you know, these artists re remade their lives. And yes, plenty of books. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much. I hope we'll get to see some of your exhibitions again in person in this beautiful, beautiful space. I encourage everyone when it's all coming back to normal to visit the the uh, river, the Hebrew home, and the and the Derfner Judaica Museum. So thank you, Susan, again for for joining us and for uh, this really wonderful talk. Thank you. Oh, Bye -bye. thank you, Magda. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>